Well, it is time for another video on mold theory and design and planning. And I'm going to be posting a video soon about this Venus statue and molding this using a matrix mold process. And I did this same tutorial uh, a few years back, but I wanted to update it and show a slightly different way to, to do the same thing. And I thought it was also a good idea, and I wanted to do this as a separate video, the thought process behind a matrix mold. And for you old timers like me, uh, you probably remember this kind of mold being referred to as a, a cavity pour or a poured blanket mold. And in this video, I wanna get into the, the how and the why of a matrix mold, of, of how you make a matrix mold and why you would matri make a matrix mold. Now, first off, the way this works is you're working in reverse. You're, in a way, it's kind of the marriage of the best attributes of both a brush-on mold and a poured block mold. And what we're going to be doing is we take our master, and we make sure it's secured to a baseboard, and that's a real important detail because ultimately this will all have to be reassembled to make our finished mold. We take our master and we clay this up in exactly the way we want the silicone to be formed later on. So much like a brush on mold, except instead of brushing on silicone, we're going to be taking clay and either rolling it out in slabs or heating it up and brushing it on over a, we put plastic wrap, typically I put saran wrap or something over my original piece to protect it. And then I build a clay shape of the mold over my part. And that allows me to sculpt that and sculpt key, key ways into it, whatever I need to do to make that exactly the way I want it. And that gives me the ability to control the thickness the way I do with a brush on mold on areas around the neck and the head. So I have a nice uniform thickness. I have undercuts filled and everything, have my flange accounted for. And once I get that all sculpted the way I want it, I build my mother mold around it. And in this case, this is gonna be a pretty basic two-piece shell going kind of corner to corner on this. And I'll build a two-piece resin shell. And one of the important things is for this, I'm gonna to need to build a pore spout on the top of her head because ultimately when this is filled with silicone, it's gonna be filled through the top. And once that mother mold is done, I'll pry those two pieces apart, remove all of the clay, and then reassemble that around my master. And what that does is that gives me a cavity, which is where we get the terminology of a, a cavity pore, uh, a cavity that's basically about a three eighths of an inch to maybe a half inch in places all over my part. Now, once everything is reassembled and sprayed with a release agent and everything, then I'm able to fill that up with silicone and then I demold it, peel off the silicone, take out my master, and now I've got my mold ready to go. Now, the advantages to this are, there's, there's a lot of different advantages to this, but it's important to know exactly what those advantages are so you don't approach this the wrong way and misuse this technique. So the main advantage to this is in mass production of figurines and similar statuary and things like this, because if you're making a fairly complicated uh, figurine mold, and you're doing it as a brush on mold, every time you make that mold, when that wears out, let's say you're doing an addition of 100 or 200 parts, you might have to make this mold three or four times. And making that mold as a brush on mold every time and making that shell every time is gonna get uh, very labor intensive. Now, at the same time, if we did a big block mold and poured that up and had to cut that out it's, it's not necessarily a lot of labor, but now we have a lot of wasted silicone every time we go to make that mold. So by marrying these two techniques together, we get the best attributes of the brush on mold by being able to shape that clay where we want the mold to be. And then we get the ability to vacuum degas and pour our silicone over our master like we would with a poured block mold. And then finally, the most important thing about this is the efficiency with which we can reproduce this. Because ultimately when we wear out that silicone mold, all we have to do is throw that out and now we have a minimal amount of silicone that we're throwing away. We reassemble that shell around our original pattern, 
pour our silicone, and bam, we got another mold. Now, the other aspect to this that's real important for those of you doing really detailed uh, 3D prints and things like that that have a lot of really fine detail, you probably want to pressure cast your parts. And with a brush on mold, no matter how well it's made, a brush on mold will have tiny little micro bubbles in between the layers of silicone. And typically those don't amount to anything unless you pressurize the mold. So being able to vacuum degas and pour the silicone around the part eliminates that and allows us to have a mold that could be subjected to pressure later on. So real important, we want to be thinking about all those things leading into this. And if we don't need the mold to do those things, then there's no reason to do that. If we just need, say, 10 of these little Venus statues, there's no reason to go through all these steps of a matrix mold. Uh, but if we know that we want to make, say, 100, 200, 300 copies of this, or we don't know how many copies we want to make, that's where a matrix mold can really excel. Now, Material selection, this is super duper important. And this is where I mentioned in my last video on the uh, Halo helmet mold, I mentioned the importance of being aware of the different products that are available. Make sure you have a good relationship with your supplier. I have my uh, BJB book handy and know what's available to you because uh, it's real easy to get kind of laser focused and think it has to be this certain material and I learned the hard way that there was a lot of times there, there might be a silicone or a casting resin or something that I didn't know about that could make my life a lot easier. So make sure you establish a good relationship with your supplier, talk to them, and if you're just starting out especially, call them up and say, hey, I'm about to do X type of mold on this piece and it's made of X and I'm thinking about doing it in this material and then I'm going to cast in this material, what do you think? It's always a good idea to bounce your plans off of other industry people and make sure you're not going at this a way that might be more complicated than it needs to be. And make sure you're not trying to do this with a material that's not appropriate for that application. Now, in choosing a silicone to do this, real important, and again, I mentioned this in my planning video about the uh, Halo helmet, real important to think backwards from your end, your end goal, what you want to be pouring into the mold, and then work back from that point. Now, in this instance, I know I want to be pouring uh, polyurethane resin into my finished mold. And ultimately, I want to be able to produce seamless copies in either clear resin, like uh, Water Clear 786, or cold cast bronze or cold cast uh, silver pieces that don't require a lot of seaming on them. So in order to do that, I want something soft and stretchy. So I want to make sure that, again, starting with my casting material, everything is going to be compatible. And since that's most likely going to lead me towards a platinum silicone, I want to make sure that the platinum silicone doesn't have any issues with my original part. Now, for this, I'm going to be using the TC5110F. Now, TC for the uninitiated stands for two components. So that just means it's a two-component system, an A-B system. And 51 is the silicone series, and then the last two digits tell you the rough softness of the material. Now, TC5110F is actually around, it's actually softer than the 10. It's more like a 5 Shore A, and very soft and stretchy. And the F is for fast, so that's a fast silicone, so that means I don't have to wait a long time to demold my part. So that particular system has about a seven to eight minute working time, a low viscosity of around 2,500 centipoise. It's a one-to-one -one mix ratio. So very easy silicone to use, fast and easy to vacuum degas. And then I can demold this in about an hour to an hour and a half, depending on the room temperature. Now, why do I want to use something that soft? The five shore A, something like that, the reason I want to go with that soft silicone is twofold. One, I want to be able to stretch this over my part and pull it out without having to cut it. So for that, I need something soft and I need something stretchy. But second of all, and this is a real important consideration when you're going to be doing cold cast bronze or any kind of cold cast metal work, is seams in cold cast pieces can be kind of tricky to clean up because as soon as you start sanding on that seam, you expose that bare resin underneath and that that can 
lead to a lot of other problems and a lot of other finishing work that is required to cover up those seams. So ideally, I want to do this as a seamless piece. And then the other thing is, when we're doing cold cast metal pieces, a firmer silicone does not grab the metal powder the way a softer silicone does. So 5110F, I'll be able to dust that mold, pour my metal powder in, almost like a, a casting resin, where I could pour the metal powder into the mold, shake it around a little bit, dump it back out, and I use a very thin veneer of metal powder spread all over the inside of the silicone mold that then transfers to my resin when I cast my resin part. So just a lot more efficient use of my metal powder, and we're using the properties of the silicone to help hold that metal powder in place until the resin bonds to it. So real important to have a thought process and a plan for every aspect of what you're going to be doing. And make sure you can visualize every step of the process. And again, one of the benefits to a matrix mold, and this is where back in the old days when silicone was ridiculously expensive, uh, this allowed you to make the shell and do all of the tooling work right up to the point of that silicone pour without ever having to buy your silicone. So you can make that two-piece shell, remove it, strip off all the clay, wad up all that clay into a ball, and you know exactly the mass of the silicone that you're going to need to purchase to make your mold. And that was really attractive for those of us who had to mail order our silicone back in the 90s. We knew exactly how much it was going to take before we had to actually order the silicone. So that's an important part of that. But again, probably the most important, most valuable aspect of this matrix mold technique is the ability and the efficiency of how we remake that. So in a production setting, you would have your original master mounted on a baseboard and you'd have it very secure so it can't move off that board. And you would even paint or drill holes so you know exactly where that shell goes back into place each time. So you can put that shell back in place, fill it up with silicone, and an hour and a half later, you have a mold ready for production again. And that way, you don't have a lot of downtime in production. If you have to take this and rebuild a mold box around it each time, that can get uh, kind of labor intensive. And especially if you're having to make a brush on mold each time, that's a whole lot of labor. So that's the whole point of this technique is to minimize that amount of turnaround time when you're doing production casting like this. So there you go. There is the thought process and the, the why and the how of making a matrix mold. And this is one of those things in the, the magic fraternity, the performance magic fraternity that I came from many moons ago. We used to have a saying about this, of, uh, this kind of situation where don't run if you're not being chased. If we're going to make this and we only need 10, 20, 30 parts, then just make a poured block mold or a brush on mold and call it done. But if we know that we're going to be making a production run, that's where we implement that matrix mold process. So as usual, if you like my content, be sure to like and subscribe and click the little bell icon so you get notified when I post new content. And at the end screen, I'm going to post some links to some important tutorials related to this, like my cure inhibition video and one of my poured block mold videos, as well as one of the brush on mold tutorials, so you can get an idea of some of that uh, approach relative to the matrix mold approach. And this matrix mold video I'll be posting soon within about a week or so. So stay tuned for that. And as always, thanks for supporting the channel and thanks for watching.